Rocket Lab brought into service a new launch pad with the successful liftoff of an Electron rocket with a commercial Japanese radar imaging satellite. The Electron rocket lifted off from Pad B at the company's Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand on February 28, carrying the Strix Beta satellite for Japanese companies inspective. Dubbed the Owl's Night continues, the mission was Rocket Lab's 24th Electron launch and the first mission of 2022. Nearly an hour after lifting off, the rocket deployed its 100 kg payload into a 561-km sun-synchronous orbit. The satellite is the second in a series of up to 30 satellites proposed by Synspective to collect synthetic aperture radar imagery. Together, these satellites will gather data of metropolitan centers on a daily basis to support urban development planning, construction and infrastructure monitoring, and disaster response. Rocket Lab launched the first satellite of the Strix program, Strix Alpha, in December 2020. On the same day as the first orbital launch from Launch Complex 1B, Rocket Lab revealed the news of the company's Neutron Rocket's first factory and launch site at Virginia. The Neutron Production Complex and Launch Pad will be located adjacent to and within the NASA Wallops Flight Facility and Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport on Virginia's eastern shore. Wallops had been the front-runner to host Neutron launches and the vehicle factory since the company announced a vehicle a year ago. Rocket Lab said it wanted to locate the factory as close as possible to the launch site to minimize transportation. The complex will be home to a rocket production, assembly, and integration facility, as well as a dedicated launch pad for the Neutron rocket located on the southern end of Wallops Island. The estimated 250,000-square-foot state-of-the-art complex will be constructed on a 28-acre site. It will be Rocket Lab's third main rocket development and production facility, joining a small factory and headquarters in Huntington Beach, California, and a more substantial Auckland, New Zealand factory. The first Neutron launch is scheduled for 2024. The Artemis 1 moon rocket is getting closer to rolling out of the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The first two of 20 platforms surrounding the Space Launch System and Orion spacecraft that allows work on the integrated system inside the building were recently retracted for rollout. Thousands of sensors and special instruments will monitor the rocket and spacecraft as they roll out for the first time on March 17. It will take the rocket 11 hours to reach Launch Complex 39B, which is located 6.5 kilometers from the assembly building. The last time a vehicle capable of carrying a crew rolled out from the Vehicle Assembly Building was in 2011, for the final flight of the Space Shuttle program. SLS will spend about a month at the pad undergoing wet dress rehearsal about two weeks after rollout. The core stage will be filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants, and then go through a practice countdown that will stop at T-9.34 seconds, just before the core stage's four RS-25 engines would ignite during an actual launch. At the end of the wet dress rehearsal, the vehicle will roll back to the assembly building for final launch preparations. That includes resolving any issues found during the test, charging batteries on the Orion spacecraft, and updating flight computer software on SLS. NASA doesn't plan to set a launch date for the Artemis 1 mission until after the wet dress rehearsal. According to the agency, a launch in April is no longer feasible, and they are considering a launch window between May 7 and 21. On March 1, appearing before a House Science Committee hearing on NASA's Artemis program, NASA Inspector General Paul Martin revealed that NASA's SLS rocket is over budget and criticized NASA and its aerospace contractors for their very poor performance in developing the vehicle. Let us hear what he said before the committee. We estimate NASA will spend $53 billion on Artemis from 2021 to 2025. Moreover, we found that the first four Artemis missions will each cost $4.1 billion per launch, a price tag that strikes us as unsustainable. Later in the hearing, Martin broke down the costs per flight, which will apply to at least the first four launches of the Artemis program. He said it would cost up to $2.2 billion to build a single SLS rocket, $568 million for ground systems, $1 billion for an Orion spacecraft, and $300 million to the European Space Agency for Orion's service module. What is striking about these costs is that they do not include the tens of billions of dollars that NASA has already spent developing the Orion spacecraft since 2005 and the Space Launch System rocket since 2011. This $4.1 billion figure represents only production costs for SLS, Orion, and ground operations and does not include the billions in development costs required to get the Artemis program to this point in time. 
One of the problems we saw in development of the SLS and Orion, it's a challenging development, of course, but we did see, notice, very poor contractor performance on Boeing's part. There's poor planning and poor execution. We saw that the cost plus contracts that NASA had been using to develop the combined SLS Orion system worked to the contractors rather than NASA's advantage. And then for NASA's part, we saw poor project management and contract oversight. Paul Martin also revealed during the committee hearing that the first moon landing is delayed until 2026. Apart from its cost, NASA's initial three Artemis missions face varying degrees of technical risk that will push launch schedules from months to years past the agency's goals. With all necessary elements for the Artemis I mission now being tested at KSC, NASA is progressing toward the first launch of the integrated SLS Orion space flight system this summer. For Artemis II, NASA is facing delays due in part to the plan to reuse key Orion components. And for Artemis III, given the time needed to develop and test the human landing system and NASA's next generation spacesuits, we estimate the date for a crewed lunar landing likely will slip to 2026 at the earliest. NASA successfully launched the newest geostationary operational environmental satellite, GOES-T, on a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. GOES-T is the third of four satellites in the GOES-R series of geostationary weather satellites built by Lockheed Martin for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. About three and a half hours after liftoff, the rocket Centaur upper stage deployed the 5,200-kg satellite into an 8,900-kilometers-high geostationary transfer orbit. Once GOES-T is positioned in a geostationary orbit 36,000 kilometers above Earth, it will be renamed GOES-18. The satellite will then begin a lengthy commissioning period before entering into service. Once operational, the satellite will provide continuous coverage of weather and hazardous environmental conditions in the Western Hemisphere. The GOES program also predicts space weather near Earth that can interfere with satellite electronics, GPS, and radio communications. GOES-T also sports an advanced lightning mapper, an updated version of the one on previous GOES-R satellites that is optimized to see atomic oxygen, which gets excited by temperatures and pressures that occur during lightning strikes. The first images from GOES-T, assuming commissioning goes well, should be flowing back to Earth around May or June. The next GOES series satellite, GOES-U, is scheduled to launch in 2024 on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX is moving forward with its plans to construct a new Starship launch pad at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. During the 2022 Starship presentation held at Starbase, Musk said that SpaceX is awaiting approval from the Federal Aviation Administration before proceeding with Starship's orbital test flight from the South Texas launch site. According to him, if the FAA demands more information about potential environmental impacts or lawsuits emerge, Starship launches could move to Kennedy Space Center. Um, now, we do have the alternative of the Cape, um, and um, we, we actually applied for environmental approval for launch from the Cape uh, a few years ago and received it. So uh, we actually are approved from an environmental standpoint to launch from 39A. SpaceX also plans to expand its facility near Roberts Road to construct a Starship production facility inside the gates of Kennedy Space Center. The facility, known as the SpaceX Operations Area, would be built on 67 acres of fallow agricultural land west of State Road 3 on Roberts Road and A Avenue. It's nearly impossible to document 24 by 7 progress at the Kennedy, but occasional aerial views captured by Greg Scott and Ferry L. Moen indicate that a lot of progress is happening there. Land clearing works are currently in progress at the Roberts Road facility. Development plans indicate that SpaceX intends to build two massive warehouse-style buildings on Roberts Road to assemble ships and boosters. This ensures that the new facility at Cape will be a massive new Starship manufacturing facility. A few days ago, Ars Technica photographer Trevor Malman captured steel segments of the Starship's orbital launch tower heading towards the Kennedy Space Center on trucks. Later, on 3 March, photographer Ferry Elmoen shared some aerial flyover shots of Roberts Road facility, revealing that those tower segments had arrived at Kennedy. These images clearly show that the steel segments are currently being prepared for assembly at Roberts Road facility. Roberts Road is approximately 11 kilometers from Pad 39A, with a single paved road optimized for white and tall loads standing between them. 
In other words, it's clear that SpaceX will construct Pad 39A's Starship launch tower at its Roberts Road facility before transporting the sections to the pad for assembly. For those who are unaware, this is precisely how SpaceX built the orbital launch tower at the Starbase. Workers pre-assembled and transported tower segments by road from the build site to the launch site, where they were stacked together with the assistance of massive cranes. SpaceX has already begun developing a site for Starship launch operations within the perimeter of Launch Complex 39A, which officials hope to complete later this year. A recent aerial shot reveals ongoing piling works just southeast of the Falcon rocket's launch platform. These piling works will ensure a sturdier base for constructing the Starship's orbital launch tower and orbital launch pad. It's an exciting prospect to think of the Starship one day lifting off from historic launch pad 39A, the very same pad that served as NASA's moonport during the Apollo era over half a century ago. Overall, it remains to be seen whether SpaceX will truly replicate Starbase at Kennedy Space Center, or if the new Starship launch site will be an upgraded version of the Starbase launch site, with numerous improvements and refinements. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. Booster 4 and Ship 20 went through a series of cryoproof tests last week. The first of those occurred on March 1, when Booster 4 underwent its fifth cryoproof test. The liquid oxygen tank of the booster was fully filled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen during the test, while the methane tank was only partially filled. Venting was observed from the orbital launch tower when the booster was cryo-tested on Tuesday. Ship 20 was cryo-tested two days later, on 3rd March. A recent aerial shot shared by RGV Aerial Photography indicates that SpaceX has physically relocated a small tent used for basic metalwork at the build site. It is reported that all the construction tents of Starbase will be replaced by a 28,000-square-meter building that will be approximately 18 meters high, 250 meters long and 120 meters wide. SpaceX has already broken ground and partially completed the foundation of the massive new tent. Last year, SpaceX brought Massey's gun shop and range near the U.S.-Mexico border, about 9 kilometers from the Starbase, to build a Raptor engine test facility. A tent is currently being built at the site, according to this aerial shot captured by RGV Aerial Photography. Deimos, one of SpaceX's Starship offshore launch and landing platforms, has begun its journey from the port of Brownsville to Pascagoula, Mississippi for retrofit. Its partner, Phobos, is currently undergoing work in that location, and soon we might see both vessels undergoing modifications at the same port. According to Musk, one of the two platforms would have a launch tower installed by the end of the year. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.